OK, hi, my name is Chow Chow and um, I'm going to start our tutorial on acute and um, endo rotation. Um, so first I'm going to go through like the AT assessment and then I'm going to go through some emergency scenarios and then um, we're going to talk about some endo conditions as well. Uh, so you might remember that emergency in emergency situations, um, we use the Dr. A, B, C, D, E approach. Um, and this allows us to systematically assess and treat our patients uh, to prevent further deterioration. So the order goes danger, response, shout for help, airway, breathing, circulation, disability and exposure. Um, and this is basically the order of which it would kill the patient first. And for each of these, each of these stages, um, there's a series of steps we go through. So we look, feel, listen, measure, treat and reassess. So after assessing for danger, response and shouting for help, we assess the airways. So the if the patient is responding and speaking to you, that means the airway is patent. So in an OSCE situation, you have to literally say out loud the airway is patent. Um, and then we want to have a look in the mouth to see if there's any secretions or any obstruction or swelling. Uh, we also want to fill the fill to see if the trachea is central and you can also feel for breath on your cheek. And in terms of listening, you want to see if there's any added sounds such as snoring, wheezes, strider um, or gurgling or if it's silent, because these are all signs that the airway is not patent. Um, and in terms of measurements, we want to get the oxygen sat and also the respirate. Um, so as we mentioned before, we want to treat any problems before we move on to the next section. So it's and it's re really important to reassess the condition of the patient as well after each section to make sure that the treatment we're giving is making a difference. Um, so we may, may want to give high flow oxygen. Um, we could use McGill forceps to remove any visible objects in the mouth or a Yanka suction to like remove any secretions. Um, there's also uh, manual manoeuvres that you can do, such as the head tilt chin lift or a jaw, th a jaw thrust. Um, so you probably wouldn't use the head tilt chin lift if there's suspected C-spine injury or trauma because they want to avoid moving their head around. So in some instances, jaw thrust might be more um, appropriate. And then if the GCS is dropping, even with management, we want to escalate and call the anaesthetist right away. And uh, it's good to remember that you can escalate at any point during your assessment. Um, you won't get penalised for calling help too early, but you will if you do it too late because it's really dangerous for the patient. So that's what a McGill forcep and um, a Yank suction looks like. Um, so we also have some pictures of some airway adjuncts and there's two types of airway adjuncts, the oropharyngeal one, which goes in the mouth and the nasal pharyngeal one, which goes up um, one of the nostrils. So the oral pharyngeal airway may trigger gag reflex in the patient. Um, so if they're unable to tolerate that, then you can use the nasal pharyngeal one. The nasal pharyngeal one is contraindicated um, if there's suspected basal skull fracture. Um, so features of that would be raccoon eyes, battle sign or C CSF rhinorrhea. And to measure which size to use um, in terms of the oral pharyngeal one, it, you should measure it from the midpoint of the incisors to the angle of mandible. And the nasal pharyngeal one should be measured based on the size of your nostril. Um, so next is breathing. We want to look to see if there's any signs of cyanosis, any respiratory distress or abnormal chest expansion. You want to feel for, again, chest expansion and also percuss the lung fields. Uh, then we want to hear the breath sounds, ideally from the front and the back of the chest. And we've already got oxygen sats and respirate. Um, you might want to consider getting an ABG or a chest X-ray. Um, and treatment would be high concentration oxygen using a non rebreathe mask. And you can consider giving uh, it through a venturi mask as well. If the patient's a known chronic CO2 retainer, for example, some COPD patients. However, in acute situations, um, 
hypoxia kills. So the main goal is to keep their oxygen stats up. So you might just choose to use a non rebreathe mask. And then at this point, you would assess, reassess again that the patient's airways are still patent. So now we've assessed and hopefully st stabilised the patient's airways and breathing. So we can move on to circulation. Uh, we will, we're going to look at the patient to see if they look generally well or unwell, um, look at their pallor, see if they're sweating, um, or if you can see a raised JVP. We're also going to feel the peripheries for uh, temperature, see if it's cold or clammy. Um, and you also want to get a peripheral and central pulse. Um, and you can also have a quick look at the ankles to see if there's any edema. Um, then we listen for the heart sounds um, and see if they're normal. In terms of investigations, uh, you want to get a heart rate, a blood pressure, um, a urine output, temperature and also might perform an ECG. Um, at this point, we probably want to also gain IV access via two large bore cannula in each anticubital fossa. That's a really useful phrase to just learn and say it in your OSCEs. Um, and we want this to administer any medications or fluids or to take any bloods. So you might want to give antibiotics or if the patient's hypertensive, you could give a fluid challenge. So that's 500 millilitres of 0.9% sodium chloride bolus over less than 15 minutes. Um, if the patient has suffered major hemorrhage, you could also give a blood transfusion. And we may also consider doing bloods. So, for example, you might do full blood count or use and ease, um, liver function tests, group and save and cross match, blood cultures, troponin, toxicology screen. It all depends on what kind of signs uh, you've picked up so far. Um, you can also catheterize the patient to measure the urine output um, and also reassess your airway and breathing. And if we're worried about sepsis, sepsis um, you could also initiate the sepsis 6. Um, so an easy way to remember that is free in and free out. So the free things in would be you want to give them high flow oxygen, you want to give start them on IV antibiotics and um, give them IV fluids. And the free out would be you want to take blood cultures and you also want to uh, get a lactate, which is part of um, your ABG. And then you also want to get a urine output. You can also take cultures from anywhere that you suspect the infection might have started. Um, so D stands for disability. Um, here you see you'll check the pupils, see if they're equal and reactive to light. So that's pearl. Or you can um, assess their AVPU, which is um, alert or responding to voice or responding to pain or unresponsive. You could also calculate their GCS. Um, so this is a scale that assesses the patient by their eye opening response, verbal and motor response. Um, it's good to remember how to work this out because they often ask about it in SBAs and OSCEs. And uh, we also want to measure uh, blood glucose and uh, AUG if you haven't already. E is for exposure. So you want to expose the patient uh, so you can do a quick top to toe examination, looking for any rashes or lesions, signs of bleeding. You can also do a, a quick abdo exam to see if it's soft and non-tender or if the bowel sounds are present. Um, also quickly feel the calves to see if they're tender and if there's time you can do a full systems examination as well. So to finish your A to E assessment, you'd want to take a full clinical history um, also look and document in the patient's clinical notes what you've done and uh, also conduct an SBAR handover to medical staff or ITU if you wanted to escalate the situation. Yeah, so that was a quick run through of the Dr. ABCDE approach for emergencies. Um, so two really common ones they might give you is sepsis and meningitis. So sepsis is a life threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. 
um, and septic shock is sepsis plus either a lactate of over two millimoles over a per litre despite uh, adequate fluid resuscitation or if the patient's requiring vasopressors to maintain their mean arterial uh, pressure of over 65. So early recognition um, and treatment is vital. So the earlier you can give them treatment, the better. And there are scoring systems in place, uh, such as the new score, the risk criterion sepsis, and the QSOFA score, um, which can help you identify if someone is with suspected sepsis. Um, and it's good to remember that there's a lower threshold for diagnosis in, of sepsis in those that are immunosuppressed, intravenous drug users, uh, patients that have had recent surgery or pregnancy, patients who have foreign material in their bodies, or those um, with communication difficulties and cognitive impairment. Um, and in terms of meningitis, um, so meningitis is inflammation of membranes surrounding brain and spinal cord. Um, I've listed some common organisms that cause meningitis. Um, and it's good to remember that if the infection is called, caused by listeria, um, herpes simplex virus, varicella zoster virus, or cytomegalovirus, um, that this may be an immunocompromised individual. So it's good to have that in mind. Um, some early features are headache, fever, leg pain, cool peripheries and abnormal skin colour. So it's quite general symptoms, but later on you might um, develop symptoms like meningism. So that's like stiff neck, photophobia and Koenig sign. Um, decreased GCS or coma state, um, seizures and other focal CNS signs, the non-blanching petechial rash and shock. Um, so you can start the investigations and treatment for meningitis together. Um, Again, it's good to start treatment as soon as possible, um, but you've got to make sure that you take your blood cultures before you give any antibiotics, as that can affect your results. If you're in a primary care setting, you need to arrange for transfer for the patient to go to secondary care. Um, and if there's a rash present, you need to give them benzoyl penicillin before they're admitted. Uh, lumbar punctures are like a key investigation uh, to diagnose meningitis. However, um, you should delay it if there's any signs of increased intracranial pressure, so such as papilloedema, uncontrolled seizures or other focal neurological signs um, and GCS less than 12. Um, also delay if there's significant bleeding risks or severe sepsis, um, rapidly spreading rashes or severe respiratory or cardiac compromise. So once you've done your lumbar puncture, the different appearance and composition of the CSF fluid can indicate what kind of infection is causing meningitis. Um, so this is this table is really good to learn because this can easily come up in exams. Um, and meningitis can affect uh, can affect a person at any age, but different organisms are more likely to cause meningitis in different age groups, as shown in this table. And you've got to remember to use the Dr. ABCDE approach, um, so ensuring that there's IV access, initiating fluids and checking um, blood glucose. Um, if the patient is also septicemic, then it's important to ask for senior help and initiate the sepsis 6 protocol um, and delay the lumbar puncture. In terms of antibiotics, typically we give uh, ceftriaxone and we also add amoxicillin if the patient is over 60 or immunocompromised. Dexamethasone can be given if the patient has meningism and the rest is kind of just supportive care. Um, prophylaxis uh, is also offered to um, household contacts or other close contacts of the patient in suspected meningococcal meningitis and usually that's um, ciprofloxin in adults. So I'm going to talk about some 
a few other emergencies uh, that they can give you. So di diabetic ketoacidosis um, occurs when excessive glucose is not metabolized due to the lack of insulin, um, resulting in ketoacidosis being the only mechanism that allows energy generation. So the body is basically pushed into starvation state and uncontrolled lipolysis results in conversion to ketone bodies, um, which leads to acidosis. So this can be fatal and is often a first presentation of type 1 diabetes. It's often precipitated by infection or a missed insulin dose or um, a myocardial infarction. The typical symptoms are very nonspecific, so drowsiness, vomiting, dehydration, abdo pain, polyuria or anorexia, and there are some more specific symptoms like ketotic breath um, and cosmol breathing. So to diagnose diabetic ketoacidosis, there needs to be acidemia, um, hypoglycemia, or the patient is a known diabetic, uh, and ketoanemia, or significant ketourea when doing a urine dipstick. And signs of severe DKA include uh, blood ketones over six millimoles per litre, um, venous bicarb less than five millimoles per litre, venous um, or arterial pH of less than seven, potassium of less than 3.5 millimoles per litre, a GCS of under 12, um, oxygen sats of under 92% on room air, a systolic blood pressure of less than 90, um, a heart rate of less than 60 or over 100, and an anion gap of over 16. So if a patient is showing one or more signs of severe DKA, you might, you might want to consider transferring them to um, an ICU or high dependency unit for more monitoring because they also might need central venous access. So following the uh, A to E assessment, we want to gain IV access. We also want to catheterize them if they haven't passed urine in an hour and also to monitor urine output. And you may want to insert an NG tube as well if the patient's super drowsy or vomiting. Um, the next most vital step is fluid replacement. So if the patient is hypertensive, then you can give them a fluid challenge. Um, otherwise, you would want to give them one litre of 0.9% sodium chloride over an hour. Then you want to give them another litre over two hours, another one over two hours, and then over four hours, and then over eight hours. So aggressive fluid resuscitation may increase risk of cerebral edema, especially in children. So that's why a slower infusion rate is indicated. And if you're particularly worried about that, you can also get a CT head. So the next step is to start a fixed rate insulin infusion. So that's 50 units to 50 millilitres of 0.9% sodium chloride. And this is infused at a rate of 0.1%. Um, unit per kilogram cut per hour. Um, and if, uh, if this is a known diabetic patient, you can continue their long acting insulin and stop the short acting. But if it's a newly diagnosed patient, then you might want to consider starting them on long acting insulin. Um, and you're aiming for a fall in blood ketones of 0 0.5 millimoles per litre per hour or a rise of bicarb of three millimoles per litre per hour. Um, so you want to continue this treatment until the ketones are less than 0 0.6 millimoles per litre, or the venous pH is over 7.3, the or the venous bicarb is over 50 millimoles per litre. So it's um, good to note that urinary ketones aren't reliable for monitoring because they can stay raised for a long period of time afterwards as well. Um, so when the glucose reaches less than 15, 14 millimoles per litre, you can start them on 10% uh, glucose infusion to prevent hyperglycemia. And you might also want to consider giving them potassium replacement um, because of the insulin therapy. So insulin drives potassium into the cells, which leads to hyperkalemia 
and that can lead to muscle weakness, cramps and arrhythmias, which are quite dangerous. So you want to monitor their potassium levels um, regularly by doing VBGs and you want to give them potassium accordingly to what their potassium levels are. Um, for all of these, for all DKA patients, you want to give them low molecular weight heparin as well. And you want to treat the infection or whatever precipitated the DKA episode. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to carry on with um, non cardiac emergencies then. So, hypoglycemic hyperosmolar state is similar in that you also get it with um, diabetes, but you get it in generally with type 2 diabetics. And in an SBA, if you don't know the type of diabetes or in real life as well, there's a few different. Um, well, a few other differences to note. So you generally get a longer history. So where the DKA is quite um, acute, you might get these like unspecific features of the fatigue, lethargy, nausea and stuff for maybe about a week or so. Um, and with severe dehydration because of that volume depletion as well. Um, and you'll get quite a high glucose. So DKA 14, 15 kind of levels, whereas in hyperosmolar sorry hypoglycemic hyperosmolar state it's more around 30 so it's a lot higher and the other thing is you don't really get a significant ketonemia with HHS and this is generally just because in type 2 diabetes you're still producing your insulin so um it's not really got to that point where ketones are being produced yet and hence why there's no acidosis either um, having said that, it's not a hard and fast rule. So in real life, you can get HHS with a ketonemia. And so at this point, you may consider giving insulin or even if the, if the um, blood glucose levels weren't dropping with fluids, you might give insulin then. But at that point, you'd have your endocrinologists and your diabetes specialists involved. So, um, so as well as these kind of or sort of unspecific um, or non-specific features, you can also get hyperviscosity type symptoms. And that's just because of this fluid depletion, you've got a raised osmolality, which then um, is increasing your viscosity of the blood as well. So that causes things like headaches, papilledema, and if that progresses, it can get to occlusive events as well. So MI, stroke, and other ischemic events. So it is really important that we try and reverse it as soon as we can. Um, but one thing to note is that it you can't just reverse it kind of straight away sort of thing um, because you can cause even more damage. So essentially the management for HHS is 0.9% um, sodium chloride IV over 48 hours. And there is a big emphasis on doing it over the correct amount of time and doing it over a kind of a gradual period of time because you've got this um, fluid depletion causing a dilutional hyponatremia. And so if you try and correct this too quickly, it can lead to something called central pontine minolysis, which is essentially just where you've got this low sodium and you're trying to correct it too quickly so it causes the sort of the brain volume to shrink as water moves out and that can lead to apoptosis of your um astrocytes your oligodendrocytes and that can then precipitate locked in syndrome which is then irreversible and obviously really awful so although it is a really severe thing and you want to reverse it quickly to avoid your ischemic events you don't want to do it too quickly that it then precipitates locked in syndrome so it's kind of a balance getting at the right amount of time just acting quickly um and then you've got on the flip side of that you've got hypoglycemia 
So this is fairly or kind of easier than hyperglycemia just because it's quite anecdotal. A lot of us get hungry and then you get kind of irritable, you get a bit anxious or like shaky. So it's easier to identify. Um, but the main kind of way it's defined is a blood glucose level of less than three millimoles per litre. And it's generally less acute or kind of less sudden um, than DKA as well. This is also really important because it's not just that the patients can be hungry, but prolonged um, hypoglycemia can cause brain death or at least brain damage if it's prolonged for too long. So you want to think about trying to fix whatever's been going on with this. Um, so Chow mentioned in your A to E that you should check your blood glucose in disability. And it is so important to check um, blood glucose because in stuff like hypoglycemia, it can precipitate seizures and comas, which you might think is like, oh, it's neuro, but just a simple blood glucose level could tell you what's actually going on. And it's such a simple management as well. So it's so important to check the glucose levels. Um, and it can just be as simple as they've, you know, they've missed a meal and they've still injected their insulin or they've injected twice as much insulin as normal. Or it could be something else such as like an insulinoma or Addison's. So there are a variety of causes, but generally it's just like they've taken too much insulin for the amount of food that they've eaten. Um, and so you want to do your bloods, glucose, insulin, C-peptide and ketones just to get a full picture of what's going on with the sugar levels. And to um, treat it, it's fairly straightforward. So if they are conscious and they're able to swallow, you want to give them something like orange juice or a quick acting. Um, so it might be like they might give them like a quick acting carbohydrate, carbohydrate, whatever it might be. If they are conscious, but they are unable to swallow for whatever reason, you can give them glucose gel, which you can just squirt through and it kind of can get through like the teeth and stuff. So even if they can't open their mouth fully, that might be a, an easy way to get it in. And then finally, if they're unconscious, not responding, there's no way to give them food safely. You can give them IV glucose, 10%. Um, you can also give them glucagon, but that won't work if they're malnourished so you just need to figure out what's going on look at the entire picture and see how you can manage this correctly and then we've got poisoning i'm not going to speak too much about poisoning um in general i'll speak a little bit about paracetamol though and then a bit about anti um dopes as well so generally in sbas they'll give you quite a um quite an obvious picture of what's going on so you obviously wouldn't have done psych so they'll try and avoid the psych psychosocial aspect and they'll you know tell you like someone's found with a bottle of open pills or their friends bought them in they're worried whatever it might be but they'll make it quite obvious um but the first thing to do before anything is just try and talk to the patient and ask them what's going on because it could have just been accidental as well they could have just taken too many pills or not known that there's a limit to the amount of paracetamol you could take. So if you can't obtain a history from them, then do that first. Um, and then like any acutely unwell person, you want to do your HPE assessment. In particular, you're looking at the respiratory, you're looking at oxygen stats and uh, GCS of less than eight as well. And at which point you want to think about calling your anaesthetist as well to get intubation. Um, and other than your just kind of your baseline investigations, you want to do some bloods, just your generic use and use FBCs, LFTs. You also want to do an INR in case it's warfarin, um, an ABG and ECG as well. Your ECG can tell you so much information about any electrolyte disturbances, potassium, calcium as well. So it can be quite a good way to figure out what's going on. Um, and then obviously just your paracetamol and salicylate levels as well as a urine serum toxicology. Um, and then get your speci specialist involved as well, because they might be able to do more than you. And if there is a specific antidote, obviously do you give that. If you're not sure what it could be, in hospitals they use something called Toxbase, which is where you can essentially just find out the antidote for whatever 
they've taken. So if it's some really rogue medicine, don't really know what the antidote is, you can find it on here. And I think it has some some kind of like not medicine stuff as well. So like if it's like venoms or whatever else, I think they have some stuff like that on there. So just generic toxins. Um, and then involvement of your psychiatric liaison team as well might be really useful if they're showing sort of suicidal tendencies or you're just worried for their for their mental health as well. So paracetamol in particular, there's two things you want to be thinking of. Um, was it a significant ingestion, but also when did they take it? So starting with significant ingestion, if it's less than 150 milligrams, you're not re or per kilogram in that day. You're not really hugely worried. You want to just kind of observe and make sure they're okay, but it's unlikely to be toxic. It's only when it gets to around 250 um, that you're thinking, yeah, maybe we need to think about giving an acetylcysteine and definitely more than 12 grams as well. Um, and you'll learn more about it in PFP as well, but the graph below, you can use that to figure out whether you need to be treating or kind of your management plan by looking at the um, time and the concentration of paracetamol and looking at to see whether it's above or below the treatment line. And at that point, you can decide whether like NAC is necessary or if you need to take another route. And then think about when they took it as well. So if the if they took the paracetamol, or they're presenting over eight hours from when they took the paracetamol, or it was staggered to turn taken over an hour or so, then you want to start it. And you also want to discuss with your seniors and the specialists as well about what's going on. And finally, with paracetamol overdose, the main thing you're thinking about is renal failure, or sorry, liver failure. Um, and so we use something called the King's College criteria for liver transplant due to paracetamol, which is where you're thinking about either the pH being less than 7.3 or looking at if there's any encephalopathy, looking at the grades of it and your INR if it's raised along with your creatinine. And this is essentially just because if you have got liver failure, your clotting factors aren't going to be produced and so your INR is going to raise, or also you're going to get a build of ammonia which can then travel to the brain, cause cerebral edema and lead to your encephalopathy, your liver failure type symptoms, your jaundice, ascites um, and whatever else you might get. So if you learn this criteria for your SVs, it will be very useful. It's not necessarily high yield, but um, it could come in SVA or an OSCE. And these are just some generic um, poisons and their antidotes along with how it might present if they have overdose in that, in that specific toxin. I'm not going to go over it in too much detail, it probably just is a bit easier to just look through it on your own and just learn it, but even the kind of fifth year type drugs, benzodiazepines and your antidepressants, you can still get asked about them in fourth year just because it's to do with toxins, um, so you still learn them. Um, Okay, so when we want to do some cardiac emergencies, these are also super high yield. They can come up in SBAs or your OSCEs. Um, and UCL especially like to repeat stations or like do at least similar stations. So if you do get ATVs and any cardiac or non-cardiac emergencies in like clean skills or mock OSCEs or whatever it is, just try and pay attention to how the patient is presenting and why the diagnosis is what it is or why the management plan is that specific management plan and just get to grips with what's going on just because at least if you have a structure for your HV and you have a kind of a rough generic idea of what's going on it makes things a lot easier when you're a bit flustered and you're real OSCE. So we start off with tachycardias. Um, the first thing you want to think about is whether there's life-threatening features or not. So your shock, syncope, like heart failure type symptoms just generic hemodynamic instability. If there isn't any, then you can move to think about the ECG. If there are, you should be doing up to three synchronised DC shocks um, and getting your seniors involved as well. If, however, there's no hemodynamic instability, 
look at your um, ECG. We're looking at whether it's a broad or narrow complex tachycardia. So broad is kind of class is over 0.12 seconds or three small squares in your ECG as well. So if it is broad, we can then classify that as either regular or irregular. Regular, you can assume it's a ventricular tachycardia up to a certain point. Um, it could be a supraventricular tachycardia with a bundle branch block as well. So supraventricular tachycardia is normal, nar normally narrow, but a bundle branch block can cause broad um, complexes. Um, but for the most part, you can assume it's ventricular tachycardia unless the vignette says otherwise. And this is just treated with a loading dose of amiodarone followed by a 24 hour infusion. So amiodarone is essentially blocking the AV node and slowing the conduction through the pathway. Um, and so it can help restore your natural, like your normal sinus rhythm. And then if it's irregular, you're thinking about maybe atrioventricular with bundle branch block um, based on the ECG or polymorphic VT. So you're like your torsar de Poin, which is treated with magnesium sulfate. It's a bit niche, but uh, overdose of magnesium sulfate can be treated with calcium gluconate. That's why we're on the topic of overdosing as well. Um, one thing to note sorry, with VT as well is that verapamil is super contraindicated. You should absolutely never give it for ventricular tachycardia. And then moving on to narrow complexes. So the same rule applies. You should split it into your regular and irregular complexes. So regular, if they're hemodynamically stable, you can start off with your vagal manoeuvres. Um, and following that, if that doesn't work, your IV adenosine. So start off with six milligrams. Um, and then if that doesn't work, 12 milligrams, that doesn't work, 18 milligrams, et cetera, et cetera. So I just realised I said amiodarone blocks the AV node, but it's actually adenosine blocks the AV node. Um, and so you can use adenosine for things like Wolf Parkinson White as well to help restore the natural pathway. Um, if it is refractory and it's not kind of, the adenosine isn't helping, you might want to think about atrial flutter. So that sawtooth like baseline um, on your ECG. And you control the rate with beach blockers or verapamil. So verapamil is a non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, which is contraindicated when used with beach blockers. So they can be used separately, but absolutely never together, or it can precipitate heart block. Um, and then you've got your irregular narrow complex tachycardia. So likely to be atrial fibrillation. And then this has its own kind of guidelines of how to treat it. So if the onset is less than 48 hours, you can think about your um, cardioversion, generally electrical, depending on the situation. Sorry, generally chemical, depending on the situation. Um, and then if onset is greater than 48 hours, then um, you think about three weeks of anticoagulation before your cardioversion or rate control with anticoagulation. And so this is where your Chad Bass score comes into it and your orbit score. Um, so I think it used to be called Hasbled. So I don't know if you've learned that one or orbit, but that essentially just weighs up your risk of um, sort of bleeding with anticoagulation. So, for example, you might have Chad's Bass of like two or three. So you need to be anticoagulated, but your orbit score might then be seven. And so you might choose not to just because the risk of bleeding is too high to warrant um, anticoagulation with the DOAC. Okay, so looking at broad complex tachycardias on their own now, um, there's a few things it could be. So it could be ventricular fibrillation. This is generally quite a chaotic. There's no real pattern. It looks a bit haphazard. And I'll show you some photos in a second as well. And then you can also have ventricular tachycardia. This is the most common one you'll see, kind of post MI, things like that. And it looks fairly kind of monitor, it looks fairly, what's the word? Kind of normal, just looks quite broad, um, but fairly even throughout the ECG. And then torsade de point, so your polymorphic VT. 
which is where your VT axis sort of fluctuates periodically around the isometric um, line. And just to throw a confusing one into the mix, an SVT could cause a broad complex tachycardia if there's a concurrent um, bundle branch block as well. And so the way to determine whether it is in fact a true VT or an SVT with a bundle branch block is to look at the QRS complex itself. So if it's 160 milliseconds or more, you can think about it being a VT. Um, or if there's fusion or capture beats. So this is essentially just where like the normal, there are normal or like narrow QRS complexes that occur with or in between the like the abnormal broad complexes. And so like a fusion B is where there's um, two things conduct at the same time. So at the SA node and the ventricular area as well. And the reason these happen in ventricular tachycardia over SVT is just that in ventricular tachycardia, the um, the the, the conduction pathway is still normal. So things can travel down as normal, but with an SVT with a bundle branch block, obviously that pathway is undamaged. And so you just get broad QRS complexes. So here's a ventricular tachycardia. So we can see it's monomorphic. So everything kind of looks the same. You can see that in each lead, all the complexes look fairly uniform and it looks like they all belong to the same ECG. Whereas if we have ventricular fibrillation, it all looks a bit haphazard. There's no real passion going on. Um, each lead looks very different. And here's ventricular fibrillation as well. And then you've got your polymorphic VT, so you can kind of see that spiraling around the isometric line. But everything just looks like it's kind of there's like lots of different patterns going on. It doesn't really look like the same ECG. So you've got a question. What I think might be easier if we just work through it together. I'm going to just break it down. So you have a 59 year old woman brought to A&E by an ambulance and she's very unwell. And the paramedics report her as drifting in and out of consciousness. On examination, she's clammy and pale. And after conducting your HV, she's still unwell. ECGs have been, or uh, well, ECGs been done, and the trace shows wide QRS complexes and a cyclical amplitude. So, which of the following would not have been responsible for this finding? So, UCL generally don't really ask negative questions, but just for the sake of this question, we will do a negative one. Um, so the first thing to think about is what the ECG is actually showing. So we've got to, we've been told it's a wide QRS complex. So we can pretty much rule out an AF. It could be an AF with a bundle branch block, but without you know, evidence of an ECG, we can rule that out for now. And we know that the amplitude is cyclical. So that implies that it's not ventricular tachycardia, not monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Um, and it's also not VF because neither of those are cyclical. And so that just leaves us with a polymorphic VT. And so we need to now think about what might cause a polymorphic VT. So what causes a broad QRS, or like a, a broad, yeah, a broad QRS? Um, I believe there is a page on PassMed or something on PassMed that just tells you what sort of medications can cause it. Um, so I would recommend learning it. There are quite a few, so it is quite annoying to learn. But if you just try and commit it to memory, it'll be very useful. So in general, there's a few drugs that do cause um, a wide QRS. It's generally also the hypos, so like the hypothermia, hypomagnesemia, kalemia, whatever else it is, calcemia. Um, and so we're looking at hypermagnesemia is quite likely at the moment. Amiridone also causes a wide QRS complex, as do antipsychotics. So haloperidol falls into that category. Um, we've already said hypothermia does cause wide QRS complexes. And serotonin is a type of SSRI, which also does. So the answer here would be hypermagnesemia. 
So these are just the guidelines. Um, I'm not going to go through them in too much detail because we've already done it. But if you can learn them, I would really recommend doing it. Um, and know kind of the numbers that sort of like when medications can be admitted, when they can't, how many minutes it needs for medication to be re-administered, just because they can come up in SBAs or off sleeves. So it is really useful to know. Okay, so just a little quick recap of your ward complex tachycardias. So look to see if they've got a pulse. If they don't have a pulse, straight away you want to be doing your advanced life support. Um, if you haven't learned it already, you will learn it at some point in the year. Um, if there is a pulse, you're looking for adverse signs. So things you've talked about before, so your shock, syncope, heart failure. Um, if that is present, up to three synchronised DC shocks straight away. You can then follow with this with amiodarone um, and consider other drugs as well if still going on. If there are no adverse signs, they're hemodynamically stable, correct any electrolyte imbalances that you might see on bloods or ECG, and then look to see if it's a regular or irregular rhythm. If it's irregular, definitely get some senior help. It could be a number of things that you need to you know, help to treat. Um, if it is regular, give amiodarone um, by your central line. See what happens and hopefully it treats it. And then for your narrow complex tachycardias, um, this is covered in your cardiology lecture. But essentially, you want to first off start by treating any reversible uh, causes of your narrow complex tachycardia. So things like your sinus tachycardia caused by dehydration, you want to give IV fluids. Multifocal tachycardia caused by CPD, you want to treat your hypercapnia and your hypoxia. Um, and so, if that's all fine, look for your adverse signs. If there are adverse signs, then same applies. You want to give your three synchronized shocks and amiodarone if necessary. Um, if there is no adverse signs and no regular rhythm, treat it as AF. And um, so you want to give like maybe like digoxin therapy or this heart failure, regular rhythm, your vagal maneuvers. Adenosine and or mill if adenosine is um, contraindicated, so like in asthmatics as well. Um, a few things to know with adenosine, it's one of the rogue drugs, there's just a lot of stuff going on with it. Six milligrams is your first dosage. You should put it into a large vein followed by a saline flush. Um, and you need to warn your patient of things like chest tightness, um, or like dyspnea, things like that, um, because there are quite you know, horrible side effects with bringing adenosine into the mix. Um, and then bradycardia. So this can be quite normal. A lot of people do just have sinus bradycardia and it's fine. A lot of athletes, um, some older people might have it as well, or just, um, just generic young people tend to have lower heart rates and it's fine. It's generally an issue when there's symptoms present. So dizziness, if you're fainting, if you're quite tired and fatigued, um, if there's any chest pain at all and breathlessness, you want to think about something else going on. So there's your cardiac pathologies, your post-MI, valvular problems, um, and just general degenerative changes. Vasovagal and endocrinological things can also cause bradycardia. And although it could be fairly like normal for that patient, you just want to check that it's nothing too sinister. And the same with metabolic as well. So just correcting any um, electrolyte disturbances as well could be such an easy way of fixing it if it is symptomatic. And drug, toxic, drug toxicity as well. Um, Cushing, Cushing's triad is one of the really important ones to know. So Cushing's triad is basically obviously bradycardia. You've also got increased um, 
also irregular decreased breathing um, and a widening pulse pressure, so systolic hypertension. It just implies a raised intracranial pressure, so you want to seek senior help for that as soon as possible because it could lead to some really awful problems. Okay, so just to recap, so you're assessing with your h 3 approach always. If there are reversible causes, there's hypoxia, stuff like that, absolutely give oxygen if necessary. Get your IV access, do your normal observations as always, and then check for any adverse features. If there's not any adverse features, but there is a risk of asystole, of heart block, um, you can think about giving it atropine. Um, if there is no adverse features, no risk of asystole, just continue. It might be fine. They might be able to just continue as normal. Um, it's only when there's really a risk of something going wrong that you want to give your atropine. Um, if that doesn't work, you can then go to transcutaneous pacing. Following that, you can give other drugs, isoprenaline, adrenaline. And if not that, you can um do transvenous pacing but you do need a cardiologist to help with that or like just an expert in the field to do that um and it's just the same sort of thing and um, this is just your um life support guidelines they go through this in clinical skills as well absolutely do learn it you need to know your four H's, your four T's, so the reversible causes of um, of kind of arrest, and just know your how to do it. I don't know if they'll treat, if they'll test it in an OSCE scenario, but there's always that chance that they could do it, and it is also just very useful for life in general. So absolutely learn the guidelines. Okay, let me try, try taking control. Did it work? Does that work? Did you give me permission? Um, oh yeah, it does work. Oh, is that you? No, that's you. Okay. Fine, that works. Okay, cool. Perfect. Um, so the last bit of I'm just going to cover endocrinology um, and various conditions listed on the screen. So basically, um, endocrinology is all about hormones. And the way to go about it is you have a hormone axis. If a hormone level is too high, you have certain symptoms, need to fix them. And if the hormone level is too low, you have symptoms and need to fix them. And the idea is that we need to maintain a balance in our bodies um, to not have any symptoms and for everything to run uh, smoothly and normally. So if you split it up into hormone axes, it'll be easier for you guys to understand. Um, so looking at diabetes first, Okay, so diabetes. Um, there are a few different types of diabetes, which we will come to in a second, but the main ones are type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. So let's look at type 1 first. Type 1 is essentially the autoimmune destruction of the pancreatic beta cells that produce insulin. Um, present earlier on as well. And the way in which it presents is polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss, and in extreme cases it can also present um, as DKA, which was covered earlier. There is some genetic component to type 1 diabetes and it's also associated with other immune condi autoimmune conditions such as celiac disease. Um, and it's particularly associated with HLA, DR3, and sometimes 4 as well. So that's a genetic association. Um, if you were to do antibody tests, 
anti-glutamic acid decarboxylase antibodies as well. And on histopathology, you'll see islet leukocytic infiltration. So that's type one. Um, type two is a bit different, the mechanism. It's mainly insulin resistance and sometimes also beta cell dysfunction causing um, slightly less insulin secretion as well. So overall, there isn't actually a lack of insulin in the body. It's just that the cells over time become unresponsive to that insulin. And so there's a relative insulin deficiency. And the age at which it generally presents is older, over the age of 40, although it can present earlier at a younger age and a big risk factor is obesity. Again, symptoms are quite similar, polyuria, polydipsia, um, and you know, in extreme cases, it can also present as HHS, which is hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state, which was covered earlier. Um, it can even present uh, with complications such as an MI as well. But more often than not, it's also asymptomatic and it quite often isn't detected in patients until a routine blood test later on in their lives. Again, there can be a genetic component, but it's mainly, you know, environmental and over time like develops with age and associations are obesity, um, alcohol consumption, Asian ethnicity and also poor fitness um, and diet as well. There are no associated antibodies with it and on histopathology you'll see islet amyloid polypeptide deposition. Um, There are other types of diabetes as well. Um, so there's a type called MODI, maturity onset diabetes of the young, which is essentially, you can think of it as type two diabetes, but in a much younger patient, probably less than 25 years old. And uh, this is where the history is important. Um, you'll see a family history of early onset diabetes um, that's quite often present. And the mode of in inheritance is an autosomal dominant. Um, inheritance. And there are a few different types. You have MODI2, you have MODI3, which is 60% um, of the cases, but you also have MODI5, which is quite rare. Um, and generally it's a mutation in the HNF1 alpha gene. And to treat MODI, you generally use sulfonylureas such as glycoside, and you don't tend to have ketosis at presentation. Then you also have latent autoimmune diabetes of adults, so LADA, and this is type 1 diabetes picture in middle-aged people. So again, it's an autoimmune condition, but you just develop it later on in life. And this is where it can present with DKA. Um, if you know, it's an autoimmune condition, there isn't enough insulin being produced, and then you can have a DKA picture as well. And it does progress quite slowly. And then you have gestational diabetes, um, which occurs during pregnancy, and it usually resolves after pregnancy, but it just means that there's increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes later on in your life um, for uh, the woman. And it can also cause some complications at birth, such as miscarriage, preterm labour, preeclampsia, malformations, and a high birth weight of the child as well. And you generally treat it with lifestyle modifications. If that doesn't work, then you can use metformin. And if that doesn't work, you can also use insulin as well. And you retest it uh, at around 13 weeks postpartum as well to see if it has resolved. Um, OK, so here's a question. A 45 year old female presents to GP with a burning sensation when urinating over the last three days, but she's otherwise, otherwise been well. Suspecting a UTI, the GP arranges a urine dip, which shows positive for nitrites, leukocytes and glucose. She's successfully treated for nit with nitrofurin toin toin and, and is followed up with a fasting blood glucose test, which was 8.6. So which of the following is the most accurate representation of the results? Um, so as you can see, this um, lady has presented with a UTI and has been successfully treated for it, um, but still has a high fasting blood glucose. But she's otherwise well. In other words, she's asymptomatic. So 
given that, the right answer would be E, inconclusive. And that's because of the criteria which we'll come to in a second. So for a diagnosis of diabetes, um, if the patient is symptomatic, then you only need one of the following, as you can see on the screen, either a fasting glucose of more than seven, a random glucose of more than 11.1, or greater than 11.1, or an HbA1c or higher than 48 millimoles per liter. However, if the patient is asymptomatic, then the criteria must be demonstrated on two separate occasions which is what we would need for the lady in the question previously because she was otherwise well and asymptomatic a singular fasting gl glucose level that's high cannot be used to diagnose her with diabetes so she needs to be retested later on at a later date and if she still has a high glucose level or a high hba1c then she can be diagnosed with diabetes um, and then you can also have impaired fasting glucose, which is a fasting plasma glucose between 6.1 and 7, or an impaired glucose tolerance, which is a fasting plasma glucose less than 7, um, or an oral glucose tolerance test that is greater than 7.8, uh, but less than 11. Um, and with impaired fasting or impaired glucose tolerance, you can manage with lifestyle advice and also annual review. But again, with the lady in the previous question, her fasting glucose was 0.6, so she wouldn't fit either of those criteria. Um, and just another note, you can you can't use HbA1c to diagnose in pregnancy, in children, in, in type 1 diabetes, or in hemoglobinopathies. And, the haemoglobinopathies in particular for a cytosis, the result for HbA1c would be lower expected, and that's because of hemolysis and reduced red cell lifespan. But then, on the contrary, if you have a B12 or folic acid deficiency or an iron deficiency or ectomy, um, expected HbA1c and that's because the red cell lifespan is higher. Um, bear in mind the HbA1c is basically the glycosylated haemoglobin, so how much glucose sticks to the haemoglobin basically. And if the lifespan of the red cells is longer, it's going to be around in the blood for longer, higher HbA1c. Um, okay, so some complications of diabetes. It's easy to split them up into microvascular and macrovascular. So if we look at the microvascular complications, um, nephropathy. Now for this, um, it's important to monitor renal function for diabetics every six months to every year, and um, as well as measuring the urine albumin and creatinine ratio um, and doing a urine dipstick as well. And even if the urine dipstick is negative for protein, they should still always have a urine um, ACR done. Um, on an ultrasound, you could potentially see large kidneys, glomerulosclerosis, or Kimmel-style Wilson lesions as well. Um, and that would all indicate nephropathy. And the way we treat them, uh, treat nephropathy is with ACE inhibitors or um, angiotensin receptor blockers as well. Um, retinopathy, um, it's to do with the eyes. It's covered more in fifth year, but I'll cover it anyway in a second. Um, for that, you have an annual screening program to just check the patient's eyes um, and check the retina as well. Maculopathy um, is basically changes in the macula specifically as in the eye. And um, again, you would treat that with aspirin. Neuropathy. For that, you do a foot examination annually, um, checking the sensation in their feet, um, checking for any ulcers, and then manage accordingly. But uh, I'll come to that as well in a second. And then we have macro macrovascular complications such as cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease. And the main thing to do, the main thing with macrovascular complications is to control the blood pressure and any risk factors that may 
cause these complications as well, such as diet or exercise and smoking. Um, we want to try and get them, the patients to reduce their um, uh, reduced reduce smoking and hopefully even stop it as well. And with a high blood pressure, you would treat it with ACE inhibitors. Um, high cholesterol levels, you would treat using statins um, because these all would contribute to an increased risk of an MI and stroke, which would um, is possibly the main cause of diabetes patients. And you can also give aspirin as well to reduce vascular events, but that's only as a secondary prevention. So that's after they have an MI or a stroke, not as a primary prevention. OK. So now looking at retinopathy. So again, this will be covered again in fifth year ophthalmology, but just be aware of it at a basic level. There are three diff there are different stages. So you have long proliferative, which can be separated into background or pre-proliferative. And then you have proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy. And the main difference between stage one and two on the screen is the fact that in proliferative retinopathy, you have new vessel formation in the retina. And so you'll see lots of redness on fundoscopy and the patient needs to be referred urgently for treatment, which would be a laser photocoagulation. Um, the reason why new vessels form is because of the lack of oxygen they need to try and get the demand for oxygen in the eye increases and so new vessels form. And on endoscopy, there are certain signs that you see diabetic retinopathy. You see blots, which would indicate hemorrhages. You'd see dots, which would be microaneurysms. You could see lipid deposits, um, which are hard exudates. Um, and you could also see cotton wool spots and some venous beading as well. Um, you can kind of see it in the pictures on the screen, um, but if not, I think Google would help to get a better picture. And the main factor involved in angiogenesis is VEGF, and we can give a monoclonal antibody called bevacizumab to try and reduce new blood vessel formation. But yeah, uh, they need to be referred urgently uh, for treatment and management of retinopathy if uh, there are changes in the retina, essentially. And then so here are some more pictures uh, of the signs that I said I mentioned. Yeah. Um, OK, neuropathy. So you can have sensory neuropathy and autonomic neuropathy. So sensory neuropathy can happen in a symmetrical sensory polyneuropathy, like a glove and stocking distribution. So it could be numbness, tingling or pain. Um, for neuropathic pain, we could give the patient amitriptyline or well. Um, Alternatively, the patient could present with amyotrophy, which is painful quadricep wasting. And for that, we would have to give IV immunoglobulins. They could also have mononeuritis multiplex, which is different to polyneuropathy in the sense that polyneuropathy is symmetrical. This affects one nerve at a time and it's a random distribution rather than symmetrical. So that's sensory. And again, sorry, mononeuritis multiplex we treat using steroids. Uh, you could have autonomic neuropathy that could present as postural hypertension. So when the patient stands up, the blood sort of pools in the peripheries and there's not enough venous return. Um, and that leads to, you know, feeling faint and then falling, um, which is obviously a hazard for the patient as well. Or you could, uh, the patient could have respiratory arrhythmia, gastroparesis, urinary retention or even erectile dysfunction as well in autonomic neuropathy. Gastroparesis is essentially where there's stasis in like the movement of the GI tract. So the patient often may complain of early satiety or bloating after meals. They could have nausea and vomiting or quite erratic blood glucose measurements as well. And the way we treat gastroparesis is with um, 
domperidone or metoclopramide, um, which are prokinetic and sort of help gastric movement. You can also have a diabetic foot, which, um, like I mentioned earlier, it's important to check for sensation in the feet of diabetic patients check for the pulses in their feet. There is a whole diabetic foot exam on Geeky Medics as well, which would be useful to learn. Um, yeah, so we're trying to check for ischemia, checking for absent foot pulses, any painless ulcers, which ties in with vascular surgery as well. Um, and again, you're trying to check for any uh, loss of sensation in the feet as well. You want to have regular foot checks um, because the thing with um, the diabetic foot is that they may not realize that they have an ulcer and that can that is like an easy source for infection uh, for the patient without them realizing because they're not in any pain so uh, next slide okay oh. Gave away the answer. So a 43 year old male has quite poorly controlled diabetes and he's not compliant with all his medications. He now complains of frequent vomiting and a bloated sensation following meals. Which of these uh, medications would be most appropriate to treat this? So like I mentioned earlier, um, this patient has presented with symptoms of gastric paresis. So given that, uh, we would want to give them metoclopramide, which is a prokinetic, or we can use domperidone. Um, I, metoclopramide is an antiemetic, but the idea is that the, an antiemetic is insufficient because the mechanism behind this condition is that the bowel is sluggish in its digestion of food. So we need to get the bowel moving, basically, and just giving an antiemetic won't help. Um, so we need a prokinetic like domperidone or metoclopramide to help bowel movement. So um, medications for diabetes. OK, so there are many different medications that can be used for diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes, um, and it can be quite difficult to get your head around them as well. But I'll try and break it down for you. So. Type 1 diabetes is easy, um, easier. So for that, we use insulin. Now, patients may be on various insulin regimes. Um, you'll hear a basal bolus regime, which is essentially they get a long acting insulin, which is their basal level um, that they have throughout the day. And then they take boluses just before meals as well. Um, but for type 2 diabetes, obviously, as we discussed, there isn't actually a lack of insulin in the body. Um, so we need to use other forms of medication to try and help increase uh, the body's response to insulin, basically. So we have drugs like metformin or pioglitazone, which increase insulin sensitivity. But then we have drugs like glycoside or acetaglyptin and exenatide, which increase insulin availability. Um, and then we also have SGLT2 inhibitors such as stapagliflozin, which increase insulin secretion as well. So firstly, the main approach uh, with a diabetic patient is to try and uh, um, modify their lifestyle. So modifying their diet, increasing their exercise, stopping smoking. And if that doesn't work, then we start them on metformin. Any diabetic patient will always be started on metformin. Um, after, you know, let's say a few months, their, metfor their HbA1c is still high, then the doctor may consider adding another drug as well. And if the patient's cure risk score is high, so they are at risk of cardiovascular events, then um, it's important to add an SGLT2 inhibitor as the second drug, um, as it's shown to help um, kidneys uh, to prevent cardiovascular events and also to reduce blood uh, sugar levels. The target for the HbA1c if the patient is on any medication for diabetes is 42 millimoles per litre 
Um, the, and if they're on hyperglycemic drugs such as glycoside or possibly on multiple different drugs, then the target is 53. Um, and, you know, if the HbA1c is greater than 58, then that's when you consider adding another drug, basically. And if the BMI is greater than 35, then you might want to consider adding insulin as well. Um, yeah. So a 72 year old man is reviewed in the diabetes clinic. He has a history of heart failure and type 2 diabetes. His current medications uh, are, include furosemide, vamipril, bisoprolol. Clinical examination is unremarkable, no evidence of peripheral edema, a clear chest and a blood pressure of 130 over 76. Recent renal and liver function tests are normal. Which of the following medications is contraindicated? So this is just a question of kind of memorizing the side effects of the drugs. Um, in this situation, the answer is pioglitazone. Sorry, I went too far. But basically, um, a big contraindication to pioglitazone is bladder cancer and heart failure, liver failure and osteoporosis. And the patient in the previous question had heart failure. So a big contraindication to that is well, that is obviously a big contraindication to pioglitazone. So here is a cheat sheet essentially of the pharmacology for all the various different drugs. It's important to know their mechanism of action, their side effects and their contraindications as well. Um, I won't go through each and everything right on this table, but it'll be just useful to just look at it and kind of learn it as well because they do come up in questions. So now let's look at hyperthyroidism. So some symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Increased basal metabolic rate, so weight loss, sweating, heat intolerance, um, warm skin, clammy hands, thyroid acropatry, or a fine tremor may be seen as well. On the face, you can have exophthalmus, periorbital edema, lid retraction, or, or a lid lag. On the neck, you may see a, um, a soft goiter that may be tender or non-tender, depending on the pathophysiology. Um, the patient may be tachycardic, may have palpitations, may present with AF or high blood pressure as well. They may present with diarrhea or a decreased appetite, um, gynecomastia, decreased libido, amenorrhea. Um, they may have proximal weakness, decreased bone density, or they may even have um, be quite anxious, um, have difficulty sleeping and quite brisk reflexes as well. Um, so on blood tests, you would see a low TSH, which is a thyroid stimulating hormone, but you would see high levels of T3 and T4. Um, hence hypothyroidism raised thyroid hormones. And if you suspect hyperthyroidism or hypo for that matter, you would always um, order thyroid function tests. So there are some specific signs of Graves' disease that you need to know about. Um, so you'd have exophthalmos, proptosis, um, increased tear production, sometimes even photophobia, loss of colour vision or decreased acuity and ophthalmoplegia as well. Um, they may, patients may also have diplopia and corneal grittiness. Um, the main thing is to just know uh, that you'll see exophthalmus and proptosis um, in a patient with Graves' disease potentially. Um, and then you'll see their nails, the thyroid acropatry, and on their calves, you'll also see like pre-tibial myxedema. Um, in terms of antibodies, if you were to test them, you'd see anti-TSH antibodies as well. So in terms of the causes and the treatment for hypothyroidism, so a big cause would be Graves' disease, but other causes could be de Quervain's thyroiditis, a toxic um, adenoma, 
uh, a toxic multinodular goiter, excess hyperthyroxine, or sometimes even drugs such as iodine can cause hyperthyroidism. And the way you treat it, um, obviously, investigations would be TFTs, looking for thyroid antibodies. You could do an ultrasound scan of the thyroid um, to check for nodules. Um, you could also do an isotope scan, looking for iodine uptake. Um, but that is not routinely done. Generally, um, you'd see TFTs being done and maybe thyroid and autoantibodies as well. Um, and in terms of management, uh, a medical approach would be giving a beta blocker for symptom control, such as propranolol, if the patient particularly, you know, feels quite anxious, has a lot of tremor, a tremor um, handshaking, then you'd give propranolol. But otherwise, the main treatment is carbimazole to mm. block thyroid hormone production. But that is a medication that you would titrate, so you start at a low dose and then increase it slowly. And the main side effect that you need to know for carbimazole is a granulocytosis. So if a patient uh, has uh, feels slightly unwell, um, they need to have a full blood count done to check for a granulocytosis as well, um, because it's an adverse effect. So always do a blood FBC if there are signs of infection in a patient who's taking carbimazole. Um, PTU is propyl thiouracil, which is the drug that is given to pregnant women who have hyperthyroidism and they can't take carbimazole. Um, and they also can't take radioactive iodine because that would increase the risk of cancer. Um, so PTU is given for pregnant patients. And you can also completely block the um, thyroid hormone axis and give leothyroxine as well. Um, a radiological approach would be iodine-131 to ablate the thyroid gland, and a surgical approach would be a thyroidectomy. However, there's a risk of hypoparathyroidism because anatomically the parathyroid glands also just sit behind the thyroid gland. So there's a risk of removing them um, in the surgery as well. Um, and there's also a risk of recurrent laryngeal nerve damage or hematoma. Um, and a complication of hyperthyroidism would be a thyroid toxic storm, um, which would you know present with a lot of um, shaking, sweating, etc. And that needs to be treated with fluids, PTU um, and propranolol as well. Um, and yeah, just generally to manage do month, uh, six monthly TFTs to monitor the thyroid hormone levels. So hypothyroidism essentially has the opposite of uh, symptoms to hyperthyroidism. So patients would have a decreased metabolic rate, so weight gain or a cold intolerance. They would have dry skin, um, very cool skin, brittle nails, um, or you know they would have a, a round puffy face and you may present a complaint of hair loss as well. Um, and particularly they may also have the loss of the outer third of the eyebrow. Um, and on a thyroid exam, it's important to check for that as well. They could also have a goiter. Uh, they'd be, they might be quite bradycardic. Uh, they may be constipated. They may have uh, a decreased libido. Uh, they may have problems with fertility as well. Again, they could have proximal weakness, carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, they could be quite fatigued, lethargic, low mood, reduced reflexes. And on bloods, you'd see a raised TSH, but a low T3 and T4, which is essentially the opposite of hyperthyroidism. Um, and again, check the thyroid function tests. And the way we manage it is by giving levothyroxine essentially. So there are a few different causes. You could have an autoimmune cause, which would be Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, it would initially present as hyperthyroidism, but then would progress to hypothyroidism. Um, and so you would need to 
give synthetic thyroid hormones, so levothyroxine, to replace um, the deficiency. You can also do autoantibodies as part of your investigation, so you'd see the anti-TPO um, as well, or the antithyroglobulin. Another cause could be subacute uh, granulomatous thyroiditis, so de Quervain's thyroiditis. Um, so here you would have quite a painful goiter and it's generally after a viral infection. And again, initially you'd have hyperthyroidism, which would progress to hypothyroidism. But the way you can differentiate from, from Hashimoto's is the fact that it's a very, very painful goiter and it's very tender. Um, and on investigation, you'd see a globally reduced uptake on a radioisotope scan and you'd see a raised ESR. Other causes could be iodine deficiency, which is seen in developing countries, or it could be iatrogenic, so after a thyroidectomy, radiotherapy, or again, other drugs such as amiodarone and lithium. You could also have postpartum or peripartum thyroiditis and subclinical hypothyroidism, which is essentially where you have a raised TSH, but you have normal T3 and T4 levels. So patients just need to be monitored um, for that, uh, like their TFTs need to be monitored in case it becomes um, hypothyroidism and then they need to be given levothyroxine. But yeah, other than levothyroxine, there aren't any other treatments really for hypothyroidism. So a 35 year old female um, has recently been diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and has been started on levothyroxine. However, her symptoms have not seemed to improve with time and her GP suspects this may be due to other, her other medications. Which of the following is most likely causing this picture? Amiodarone, hydrocortisone, ferrosulfate, simetidine, or azathioprine? This one's a bit hard. So it's ferrosulfate um, because it interferes with levothyroxine absorption. So you may be taking the medication, but if it's not being absorbed, then it's not going to have any effect really. And her symptoms won't improve as a result. And um, others that other drugs that may interfere with T4 absorption, um, uh, aluminium hydroxide or dietary fiber supplements and calcium carbonate as well. So, ADH and vasopressin, oh, the same, they're the same thing. Um, before we go into diabetes insipidus, ADH is essentially released when serum osmolality is high. So the serum is concentrated, um, doesn't have, there's not much water in the serum, so we need to dilute it essentially, which is why ADH is released and that would increase water reabsorption in the kidneys, hence diluting the serum and reducing the osmolality. So diabetes insipidus. Um, this is where there's essentially impaired water reabsorb reabsorption in the kidney. Now, it, other differentials could be diabetes mellitus or diuretic or lithium use or primary polydipsia. Um, and the, a patient may present with, you know, excretion of large volumes of urine. There's, there's very, very dilute. And that's again, because of the impaired water reabsorption. So it's all just being um, peed out. Now diabetes insipidus can be separated into nephrogenic and cranial. Um, so nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, this is because of ADH insensitivity in the collecting duct. So V2 receptors no longer respond to the ADH. And so there is no pour in two channels. So the water isn't being reabsorbed and it's just being um, uh, peed out, basically. And causes can be drugs, particularly lithium. It could be genetic. It could be other renal problems. It could be pregnancy or it could be electrolyte imbalances. And we treat it by treating the underlying cause. Um, giving thiazide diuretics or um, encouraging a low salt and protein diet. Um, you can also have cranial diabetes insipidus, which is um, the failure of 
production of ADH in the pituitary gland. So if there's no ADH, there's no V2 receptor activity. Um, even though there may actually be nothing wrong with the V2 receptors, because there's no ADH, they are not responding to anything. And this can be idiopathic, it can be genetic, it can also be because of a traumatic brain injury, it could be because of a tumour in the brain, sarcoid infection, hemochromatosis, and the main treatment for cranial diabetes insipidus is vasopressin, so synthetic ADH basically, um, because there is no problem with the receptors, it, there's just a lack of ADH, so if we give the patient that, it solves the problem basically. Um, and again, the patient may present with polydipsia, um, extreme thirst, um, quite lethargic, um, and on blood tests they may have hypernatremia as well. They will also have a high plasma osmolality, so the plasma is very concentrated, and a low urine osmolality because the urine is very dilute. So a urine osmolality that's high, it actually excludes diabetes insipidus. And the way we test for DI is by doing the water deprivation test. So um, you restrict the patient of fluid for about eight hours um, and that basically tests the ability of the kidneys to concentrate the urine and this helps us localize the cause. So if after eight hours the urine osmolality is greater than 800 then that's normal and the patient has primary polydipsia. However, if the urine osmolality is between 300 to 800, then it could be primary polydipsia or partial central DI. So um, not an absolute lack of ADH, but a partial lack of it. However, if the urine osmolality is less than 300, then it indicates diabetes insipidus. Then the next step would be to give desmopressin to see whether it's cranial DI or nephrogenic DI. If after the administration of desmopressin, uh, which is given intramuscularly, if the urine osmolality increases by 50%, so rises to above 600 or 800, then we know that it's cranial DI. But if it doesn't rise that high and the urine osmolality generally remains less than 600, then it's nephrogenic DI. And again, um, the management was mentioned earlier, but yeah, either give desmopressin like, uh, to the patient for cranial DI or you treat the underlying cause. Then you have symptom of inappropriate ADH, um, which again is kind of the opposite of uh, diabetes insipidus. So here there's too much ADH, so too much water is being reabsorbed. So you have the opposite happening. You have a hyponatremia because of excessive water retention, a low plasma osmolality, a high urine osmolality um, because there's too much water being reabsorbed and not enough in the urine. But overall, the fluid status is euvolemic. And the management for this is, again, to treat the underlying cause um, fluid restrict the patient um, and if needed they can use furosemide. They can also use democlocycline to reduce the response um, of the collecting duct cell and slowly correct the, slow, the sodium. This was mentioned earlier but the sodium cannot be co uh, corrected rapidly so fluids cannot be given quickly because otherwise that can cause central pontine myelinolysis. Um, so to prevent that, we have to slowly uh, correct the sodium levels. Uh, again, uh, SIAE has many different causes. Could be drugs, SSRIs, amiodarone, opiates, carbamazepine, uh, antipsychotics, sulfonylureas, could be cancer, particularly small cell lung cancer. That's uh, one of the uh, paraneoplastic conditions. Um, again, there could be cranial causes such as meningitis, encephalitis, um, 
TB or a stroke or a tumour, um, subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, or it could be infective causes such as a lung abscess or a brain abscess or a pneumonia. So now we have, now we'll look at the adrenal axis. So the adrenal gland is split into layers. Um, you have the cortex and the medulla, and the cortex is separated into three layers: um, zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona reticularis. So the mineralocorticoids they control sodium and potassium balance. They're produced in the zona glomerulosa. Glucocorticoids control carbohydrate, lipid, and protein metabolism. They're produced in the zona fasciculata. Androgens are produced in the zona reticularis. Um, they're produced uh, in a weaker form, and then they're peripherally converted into more, more potent forms. And then in the adrenal medulla, you have uh, stress hormones like adrenaline and noradrenaline produced there. So Cushing syndrome. This is where you have high cortisol. Um, and patients may present with uh, symptoms of you know, red cheeks, a uh, buffalo hump, abdominal striae, um, easy bruising, um, tronchal obesity and you know, thin arms and legs. Um, they may have hypertension and maybe hypokalemic with metabolic alkalosis. They may have osteoporosis and immune suppression, so they may be prone to infections as well. But yeah, Cushing syndrome is purely high cortisol. Then we need to figure out the actual cause of the Cushing syndrome. Now, I've got a picture up the a picture of the adrenal axis there. Um, but Cushing syndrome could be due to an ACTH dependent cause or an ACTH independent cause. Um, and depending on what it is, will depend on like the cause of it. So let's look at ACTH dependent. So this is where there is excessive ACTH being produced, which will then trigger the adrenal gland to produce a lot of cortisol. And that is known as Cushing's disease, uh, specifically if the patient has a pituitary ACTH secreting um, adenoma. Um, Another ACTH dependent cause would be ectopic ACTH, which would um, is another paraneoplastic syndrome of um, small cell lung cancer um, or neuroendocrine tumors as well. ACTH independent causes would be a primary adrenal adenoma. So there's nothing wrong with the pituitaries. Um, there is an adenoma of the adrenal gland, so that's why there's excess cortisol. Or it could be an exogenous cause as well, so if the patient has been on long-term steroids. So investigating Cushing syndrome. The first line test is the overnight dexamethasone suppression test. So once you've established that the patient has a high cortisol level, you do the overnight dexamethasone suppression test to try and um, determine where, what the cause actually is. Um, so if we look at the column for the high dose test, um, which is the overnight test. So if a patient has an adrenal adenoma, the cortisol would not be suppressed, um, even though the ACTH is low, because as we established earlier, it's an ACTH independent cause. If the patient has a pituitary adenoma, the ACTH will be high because despite the suppression, there is still a lot of ACTH being produced, um, but the cortisol would remain low. And if you have ectopic ACTH production, again, the ACTH is high regardless because it's coming from an outside source. Um, and so the cortisol levels aren't suppressed either. Um, OK. Too far. I went too far. So treat, treatment depends on the cause. So again, if it's iatrogenic, so if it's caused by long term steroids, stop the steroids. But bear in mind, we can't just stop the patients uh, from uh, quickly. We have to wean them off steroids, gradually reduce the dose. If um, the patient has Cushing's disease, so a pituitary adenoma, um, we use surgery. 
transphenoidal tumour removal. If it's an adrenal adenoma, again, surgery to remove it. If it's ectopic ACTH, again, caused by a small cell lung cancer, you have the resection of the tumour. Um, and before the operation, there are some medications that you can give, such as metyroprone, ketoconazole. The mechanism is given there um, on the slide as well. Another thing to note is something called Nelson syndrome, and this is after a, an ad adrenalectomy, which could be for the adrenal ad adenoma. Because the adrenal gland has been removed, the ACTH will continue to be raised because there's no negative feedback. Um, the axis has been disrupted, essentially, and that can then lead to pituitary enlargement and hyperpigmentation, giving an Addison's kind of picture. Um, so it's good to just be aware of that as well. So Addison, enough um, cortisol. So primary adrenal insufficiency. Commonest causes include autoimmune um, just an autoimmune condition, TB infiltration, or a metastatic carcinoma, such as a lung cancer. And symptoms can be um, a patient that's quite lean, um, they're tanned, they're quite tired, they're weak, um, they're hypotensive, hyponatremic, but hyperkalemic and hypovolemic. And they may present with weight loss, nausea and vomiting, and particularly the hyperpigmentation, such as in the creases of their palms or around their lips as well. Um, that's common. So in terms of management, um, with Addison's, sorry, I missed a slide. So investigating Addison's. You need to do some baseline blood tests and you'll commonly see a raised potassium and low sodium. You'll also see a raised calcium and low glucose. In Cushing syndrome, you'll see a higher glucose rather than a lower glucose. And again, you want to do a 9 a.m. cortisol with Cushing's, except this time you'll see a level. And that's when you do the short synacthin test on the patient. And that's when you measure the plasma cortisol before and 30 minutes after an ACTH analogue. And if it's not Addison's disease, the level will be higher than 550. But if the patient does in fact have Addison's disease, the cortisol level will still remain really low, even after the administration of an ACTH analogue. Um, and the antibody um, that may cause it, if it's an autoimmune condition, is the 21-hydroxylase antibody. Uh, a chest x-ray could be done to look for signs of tuberculosis, or you can do the MANTU test as well. Now, to treat Addison's, you have to essentially replace the hormone. So hydrocortisone is given daily and fludrocortisone is given daily. Now, a really important thing to remember with giving steroid replacement um, uh, is sick day rules. So when the patient is ill, um, whether they just have a cold or regardless, they need to remember to double the dose of hydrocortisone. Um, this is because even if the patient may not be, you know, eating and drinking as per normal, um, they need to still double the dose of hydrocortisone as our body tends to use um, these hormones more when we're ill, basically. Um, if oral medication is not possible, then the patient may be admitted uh, for IV or IM hormone replacement. And the patient should always wear a bracelet as well if they're taking steroids in case they have, you know, um, an Addisonian crisis or, um, urgently need steroids or anything, they should just have the bracelet on. So it's good to inform the patient of that as well. Um, OK, so primary hyperaldosteronism, CON syndrome. This is um, causes could be bilateral adrenal hyperplasia or an adrenal adenoma or carcinoma. And this is essentially excess, <coughs> sorry, aldosterone. And the first line of investigation is an aldosterone renin ratio test. And in this, the ratio will be high because you have a high aldosterone and a low renin. The patient may have hypertension, high sodium, low potassium and a metabolic alkalosis. Um, 
an abdominal CT scan and an adrenal vein sampling may be done to differentiate unilateral or bilateral causes. Um, and the treatment, either you have the patient will need surgery to remove the adenoma, or a medical approach would be to give aldosterone antagonists such as spironolactone. Now, parathyroid hormone. So the parathyroid hormone is responsible um, in the homeostasis of calcium and phosphate. So if there is a low calcium level, a low vitamin D level or a high phosphate level, that triggers an increase um, in parathyroid hormone secretion. And what this hormone does is that it essentially increases absorption of phosphate and calcium in the gut increases phosphate excretion and increases calcium reabsorption in the kidneys and in the bones it increases the breakdown of bones so that releases more calcium and phosphate into the blood um so you can remember the parathyroid hormone as the phosphate trashing hormone if that helps as well so majority of the cases for hyperparathyroidism so a raised parathyroid hormone level um, are caused by a primary adenoma. And in that you'll see a raised calcium, low phosphate and a raised parathyroid hormone. So that's primary um, parathyroid, hyperparathyroidism. Secondary hyperparathyroidism could be caused by CKD, so chronic kidney disease or vitamin D deficiency. And in that you'll see a low calcium, a raised phosphate and a raised PTH as well. Tertiary hyperparathyroidism, um, you'd see if, you know, over a very long period of time, if the patient has had chronic kidney disease for a long time, um, you'd, there would be a change in the parathyroid glands such that the calcium would be high, the phosphate is high, and the parathyroid hormone is very, very high. But that's not commonly seen in questions you'll down to primary and secondary hyperparathyroidism and just remember that the main cause for primary hyperparathyroidism is a pituitary um, an adenoma um, of the parathyroid gland and the treatment is usually a parathyroidectomy um, because it often tends to be because of an adenoma um, okay so pituitary adenoma so these almost always are benign um, and they can be separated into a micro and macro adenoma based on the size. And the way they can present is, you know, with a headache or, or basically high temporal hemianopia, so loss of the um, like the outer visual fields, the temporal visual field or cranial DI. Um, now, the, the adenoma could be a prolactin secreting one, which is quite common, the commonest really, or it can be a non-secreting adenoma as well. So uh, pan hypopituitary, it's not secreting anything. Or it can be a growth hormone secreting adenoma, which would cause acromegaly. Or it could be an ACTH secreting adenoma, which would cause Cushing's disease, as we explained earlier. And by doing an MRI um which would just essentially diagnose the adenoma and the way we'd manage it is that if it was a prolactinoma we'd use a dopamine agonist such as carbogolin or bromocryptin and dopamine basically inhibits the release of prolactin basically um just be aware of the symptoms of hypercalcemia um there we are um you can see you um, bones, stones, moans, and psychiatric overtones. So, you know, the patient may present with bone pain, renal stones, um, quite, you know, heavily constipated, and also 
you know, they may feel quite low, um, hence the psychiatric overtones. And on imaging, you may see a pepper pot skull. Um, it came up briefly for a second on the screen there um, as well. Uh, or you may see uh, some periosteal erosion, cysts or brown tumours of the phalanges um, on X-ray. Um, and other differentials for hypercalcemia would be malignancy, such as a squamous cell lung cancer, releasing par parathyroid hormone related peptide, multiple myeloma or uh, bone mets as well, which are very, very important. The multiple myeloma is um, an important one to remember as well as malignancy, other malignancies. So, um, the question, a 52 year old man presents to his GP as he's concerned about a discharge from his nipples. Which of the following drugs is most likely to be responsible? Uh, Vanitidin, isoniazid, digoxin, spironolactone and Um, Again, this is just something that you need to know. The answer is metoclopramide because that increases prolactin secretion. It's a dopamine um, it affects the dopamine pathway and obviously as I mentioned earlier uh, where'd it go dopamine inhibits the release of prolactin um, which is why metoclopramide can um, cause a discharge from his nipples because it can increase the prolactin secretion um, and the others some drugs may cause gynecomastia but yeah that's the end of the tutorial. Any questions? Um, if not, we would appreciate if you could fill in this feedback form for us. Um, we do appreciate all the feedback we can get. Thank you.